You're listening to a Thames Estuary Partnership podcast celebrating London's famous tidal river. We hope you enjoy it. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Talk of the Thames. I'm your host Chloe Russell and on today's episode I'm bringing you a special programme all about the Thames Catchment Community Eel Project. Today marks the day of World Fish Migration Day and who could have picked a better day to share this episode? The Thames Catchment Community Eel Project was driven to aid the long-term survival of the European eel. Thames River Trust led the project in partnership with fellow River Trust Action for the River Kennet, abbreviated to ARC, South East Rivers Trust, abbreviated to SET, and Thames 21. Together, the partnership worked closely with Zoological Society of London and the Thames Estuary Partnership to create an app called River Obstacles that was designed for citizen scientists to use to identify, assess and map barriers to eel migration in our rivers. Today's episode is broken down into four segments, giving you an overview of the project, the ins and outs of the methodology Obstacles and the citizen science app that came out of it, the community engagement activities designed to teach people of all ages about these wonderful creatures, and finally how the data management was processed and how the teams are planning to move forward. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the first segment of the episode where we're joined by project leader Anna Forbes from Thames River Trust, who gives us an overview of the project and its goals for the future. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello and a warm welcome to Anna Forbes. How are you doing on this lovely sunny day, Anna? I'm doing very well, thank you, Chloe. Um, doing lots of final reporting for this eel project. Ooh, that sounds fun. I guess you're coming right to the end now. It is getting right near the end, only a couple of weeks to go. So tying up any loose ends and doing all the evaluation and end of project reporting. So it's the least fun but a very important part of any project. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I really appreciate you coming on in this really tight timeline. That's all right. It will make a pleasant change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it'll be great for you to give us an overview of the project, but before we get stuck in, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at the Thames River Trust and what led you on to the Thames Catchment Community Ills Project? So Thames Rivers Trust is a hub trust for the whole of the Thames catchment. So we bring other rivers trusts together to try and work together in partnership and to share knowledge, experience and skills. And the project that we've been working on now, the Thames Catchment Community Eels Project, um, was a pilot project to bring together some of those partner rivers trusts and other organisations, ZFL, Thames Estuary Partnership, to try and create a project where we could achieve so much more together than us all working separately. And I think it really has done what we set out to do, which is exciting given the challenging few years we've kind of had to deliver the project within. So I've project managed it and it's been a really interesting project with the different elements to kind of bring it together and watch what works, what works particularly well or not. So, yeah, it's been a really nice project to work on. That sounds great. How did the project come about? We had been planning a project before the Green Recovery Challenge Fund applications came about and it was still an eel project. And then when it was quite a small window to put a project together for this Green Recovery Challenge Fund money. And so we adapted a project that we were already working on, but it still achieved everything we wanted to do. So that's how it kind of came about that we were already planning an eel project and then we kind of modified some things to make it be able to get the application in for this green recovery money. Mm. Yeah I was wondering how how it came about that you chose European eels was there ever going to be a second con tender? <laughs> By the time that it, for this specific funding we firmly decided on eels but in the project we've been planning even before this one kind of in, it ended up being this one we'd already decided we wanted the european eel to be the focus because although it might not be cute and cuddly it's <laughs> you know it's a really important fish and it has got a fascinating life cycle that i think many people don't know about and 
it, so it's a really winning species once you start talking about it to get people on all levels interested and it really does need its profile raised because it is facing a lot of issues including barriers to fish migration and all of us working in and by rivers knowing that if we can improve it for the eel that's important in itself but equally you're then going to be improving rivers for a multitude of other species as well and if you mm. can get people out and about learning about eels um, in the educational element of the project you can draw them in and teach them and get them involved hopefully in valuing and enjoying their rivers and learning about the eel but on about so many other areas to do with rivers and wildlife also. Mm, absolutely. There's a couple of things that I'd love for you to explain to our listeners a little bit further. You mentioned the life cycle of the European eel. Can you can you explain to us what sort of journey they have to go through? So when they first hatch out of tiny little eggs in the Sargasso Sea, which is around 6,500 kilometres away from us here, they drift as teeny little leptocephalus across from the currents of the ocean. Obviously, a lot of them won't make it because they'll be an important part of the food chain. But those that do on that journey from the Sargasso to reaching the Thames estuary will then, in the last part of that journey, develop into teeny little glass eels, so little teeny transparency through eels. Then as they come up our rivers, they will then turn into elvers, so kind of mini eels then. So they've got pigmentation and a kind of grey-brown colour. And they're still kind of in groups then, travelling en masse on what's known as the elver run at night, up our rivers, finding suitable habitat, places where they can hide, places where they can eat. And they need to start spreading out to kind of have their own territory so you haven't got too many in one place because obviously then left will survive. And then they, during the many years they spend in our freshwater rivers, they then turn into what are known as yellow eels. And that is the longest part of their different life cycle stages, which can vary from seven years to 30 years, or in some cases people think up to 50 years or more in our freshwater rivers, before eventually getting close to being mature and then turning back, going back down through the, the tributaries, then into the Thames, then out into the Thames estuary and then back out across the ocean. And that is when they, during that return journey, develop back, develop into silver eels, which is the final life cycle stage of an eel. And during that whole journey on the way back, they won't eat and, um, and they make the journey back much quicker than they make the journey here. So it's, it's a really, tough life if you're an eel and no one knows quite why they need to come all the way inland and spend a lot of their life here before going all the way back and they only spawn once in their lifetime so the, for each eel that makes that whole life cycle it's so important because that will spawn the next generation of eels Mm, that is a crazy journey i mean they're so small when they start that journey as well it's kind of yeah. It's overwhelming to, yeah. have, to put it into perspective. Yeah, so being like less than half a centimetre long and transparent to eventually the big female eels, when they're mature silver eels going back, can be kind of a metre long and, you know, quite chunky fish. So it's important that our rivers have enough food in to sustain these eels to build up all that fat and muscle to try and make that journey back. And you mentioned their migration and barriers. When we talk about barriers, what are these? Things like weirs. So in-river barriers that stop fish, especially eels, from migrating upstream are things like locks, potentially, and dams and sluices, all those kinds of things that stop a kind of man-made structure generally that stops connectivity of our rivers. Is that an issue when they go toward when they go into the freshwater? Is that much of is that the same issue as coming out when it comes to the barriers? It can depend on what the barrier is. The going back would be kind of easier than the coming here, but it can depend on how big a weir is. Because if they go on the way back, they might be able to kind of depending on what sort of lip there is on the weir, they might be able to kind of get back to it. Whereas they wouldn't actually be able to get past it. If that go, go in the kind of up, heading upstream direction. That's why it's just really important that we 
one, identify all the barriers. Then we assess the possibility of the barrier. Then we work out what's the best way to, you know, is it possible to remove the barrier? Because that's the ultimate aim. If you can remove a barrier, then you've opened up fish migration for all types of fish that need to use that river. But if you can't do that, you might put in a bypass channel to bypass whatever the barrier is, or you might put in some form of eel pass, or, you know, which could be eel tiles, or it could be more the kind of metal type of path with little bristles inside that help eels get up. So there's lots of different kind of solutions, but the best solution that we know it's not always possible is the removal of a barrier. Mm. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, to a, to a lay person listening to this, I feel like that's the answer, just get rid of all the barriers, but of course that wouldn't work. Can you tell me what are the positive and negative impacts of having barriers? So some people would say the positive is sometimes when people want to hold water back, um, but that depends what angle you're looking at it to whether that is positive or not. Sometimes you might have a gauging weir that needs to be there, and so that would be an EA structure that can't always be removed. But then you might put things called baffles onto that gauging weir, which enable eels to kind of wiggle around or wriggle over them. Or sometimes you might have to put a thing called a rock ramp in. There's lots of solutions, even if you can't get rid of a structure because it's forming a purpose that a landowner might require. You can you can still be creative and think of ways to try and make it so it's not such a big blockage so that fish like eels can kind of swim up a bit, rest, swim up a bit more and rest and get there. They need Sometimes what we found in this project is that Although there is clearly a barrier, sometimes those barriers are passable because they have what's called crawling media, which is kind of at the, each side of something like a weir, you might have kind of mosses or other plants growing at the sides of the walls where the barrier is. And if that's continuous, it means that little elvers, those small eels, can kind of get purchased and wiggle along on that and get make it over. So that's the kind of the joy of this project has been having the volunteers get trained up and go out and do this eel passability scoring system known as an EBAT score. And then it kind of there's a whole different different bits and pieces to fill in, including putting whether there's crawling media. So sometimes it can be where we know that might not work for all fish species, but where we focus on eels specifically, we know actually that one isn't an imminent problem because it's got the crawling media there. So we know that eels can make it past. Mm, thank you for explaining that. Going back to the overview of the project, what would you say the objectives and goals were of the project? And would you say that you met them? One very simple objective was to raise the profile of the European eel. And I think in a whole variety of ways we have done that and and the other work there were there were three there was raising awareness of the european eel through kind of educational outreach with communities and schools there was um contributing to um eel trap monitoring by training volunteers to monitor eels on an eel trap and that was done by southeast rivers trust And so that was done and we kind of exceeded on that with um, them training up more volunteers and doing a really significant amount of monitoring there and getting data fed into ZFL's Thames-wide eel monitoring. And then the other element was to create a new methodology for assessing barriers to eel migration. And that was led by ZSL, but with um, working with the whole partnership of the people involved in this project. And that was how um, obstacles, as it became known, the citizen science volunteers being trained to go out and do this mapping using an app came about. So we, I would say we've been successful with it all, which is which is really nice to say. Yeah, we've, we've had 97 volunteers train up to become these citizen science obstacle barrier surveyors, which has been great. And they've got to go out in small teams get to know each other you know like-minded people getting out walking riverbanks with a really good purpose for us but also hopefully get it and we know from feedback getting enjoyment from being closer to nature and discovering new parts of their local rivers so that all worked 
really well and has given us this new robust data showing that baseline data was actually pretty much out of date in a variety of ways and that has then given the partners in this project the data to then start planning where to prioritize eel passage in the future we've tried to help eel in a real variety of ways from actually getting closer to physically dealing with some of these barriers but also getting local communities along the five target rivers we chose for this project to really get closer to their river and understand it a little bit more and get an enjoyment and value out of it. That's brilliant. It sounds like such a positive project and I think you should be very proud of all your successes it's, and during a pandemic as well. It's brilliant. What what would you say works and what would you improve for next time? I think we promised a lot in the small or in the length of the project. And so I think we did really well all the partners to kind of achieve what we did things like getting landowner permission for example on sometimes some stretches of river if particularly if it was a partner rivers trust reaching out to work in a catchment they hadn't before so sometimes it might take one phone call to get landowner permission to, to um, walk their river bank but other times it could take an awful lot of chasing up and following up to identify a landowner then get them to understand why why we wanted to have some volunteers walking along their riverbank yeah i think allowing time for development which we didn't have much of for this project but i think we still should like you said earlier be hopefully rightfully proud of all that we have achieved yeah mm, definitely and i always think you can try and improve on reaching out to more and more people which is always a challenge because you can advertise i think in a host of different ways Mm. You know, to work with different individuals and different community groups, which the groups we work with were quite diverse and were all groups we hadn't worked with before, which I think was really nice to make all those new connections, which will last hopefully beyond this project. But now they're aware of the Rivers Trusts and the, the, the Eels and these kind of projects. And I, so I think once you've got to know a group or individuals, they're then keen to do stuff with you again in the future. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, definitely. What about the futures for this project? What can people expect now? Our next steps, at the moment, we've been working together and Thames Estuary Partnership have been running a couple of co-design workshops with us so that we can start planning a legacy project. So to Mm. kind of go on with the existing partners of this project, but actually expand to work on more rivers within the catchment and bring in more partners and deliver more of the same but equally build on that and kind of maybe bring in some new elements as well so at the moment it's we're just kind of creating some high level budgets and timelines so that we can start thinking of where to apply for more funding to make carrying on the project possible Mm. would you if you had to pick a second option for a fish what would what would you choose Mm, it's quite a difficult one because there's different fish in different rivers within the catchment so there would be some people who might go and choose something interesting like the sea trout but that might not be a good species for some other of the other rivers trusts who are involved because they're too far inland so it might be okay. different fish species as a second one or equally there's things like like the white clawed crayfish which i think is a really interesting not mm. obviously not a fish but an interesting species and that's again in a lot of trouble and it would be quite interesting to perhaps do some eDNA testing across the catchment to see where that still is because it's really difficult to know. Mm. It's a really interesting project. Did you did you go to any of the workshops for the schools or the talks or anything? Yes, I I I kind of because I've been involved from various angles, I've been to some of those and the resources that were developed, I created those with input from the partners as everything was try- we tried to do was a kind of collaboration mm. and it was great to see what the children got out of it particularly when they've had a really strange couple of years we ran some of these workshops were in classrooms some were via zoom and some were actually out by the river mm. and so it's always the ultimate aim is to get those children out at least by the river because they're going to get far much more out of it but obviously when that wasn't an option zoom was was better than nothing and still got children excited because it was still something a bit different seeing someone else through the screen. That's lovely. 
Yeah, That's it so was sweet. great. And it's re- if you can get messages through to children, they will go home and relay what they've been excited about yeah. and what new, new knowledge they've gained. Yeah. And when they're out, hopefully walking by a big river in the future, they may or may not get to see an eel, but they'll hopefully think of the eel in their river and the other things that they've learned about, about how they can all contribute to kind of healthy river habitats and the messages we had in the resources that we gave the children to take home. They had nice eel comics and eel fact files. And within that, it was saying about, you know, being mindful about the amount of water you use because, you know, we need to have plenty of water in our rivers and little messages like that and about using a bin or taking your litter home. Those simple messages, but I think you can, getting them across is really important given the state a lot of our rivers are in. Definitely, definitely. It's a really good science communication method. I think you're right saying where kids, they will, they'll learn everything at school and then all that goes into their parents. So you're hitting two generations in one. And especially like what you said about going out for walks and they can recall information. I think that's really sweet. Very much. And we, we also created um, an online eel game and an online eel gallery so that lots of the schools took up the opportunity to do eel artwork based on the eel workshop. So we got all of photographs of all that eel artwork and uploaded it to an eel gallery on the Thames Rivers Trust website oh. so that children could go in and find their school and then scroll down to see their, <laughs> their paper mache eel. But <laughs> you could see some of them had really taken their time because they'd learn about the eel's key body features and so Brilliant. on so that, you know, they you know, they made them really well. And so, again, by having that doing as well as listening and so on is a great way to get them to remember what they've learned. Absolutely. And, but have oh, fun. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, it's obviously evident that what you're doing is having an impact. So well done. That's brilliant. Yeah, as a wrap up, have you got any takeaway messages for our listeners about European eels? Probably that, you know, this is a fish that's been around for such a long time and is a you know, and I it genuinely is an iconic fish for, for the Thames catchment area. And we might not get to see them that often, but they are really important. And so we really do need to look after our rivers and um, people who want to volunteer with any rivers trust, particularly the ones mentioned in this project, you know, is a great way of helping, hopefully with eels, but with other wildlife in there and so on too. Brilliant. And if people want to volunteer in the future, where how can they do that? If you go on to any of the Rivers Trust websites, there are Rivers Trusts all over the country, as well as in the Thames area. And and that's a way of how to get get involved. So or you can visit Thames Rivers Trust website, which is our website, and on there there's a page there which has got um links to each of the Rivers Trusts that are our partner trusts. Brilliant. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Well, Anna, thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for all your knowledge. It's been very interesting. I appreciate that. And again, you should feel very proud of what you've accomplished. It's It looks and sounds like a brilliant, brilliant project and I wish all the best for the future of it. Thanks very much, Chloe. Up next in our second segment, we have Jess Mead at the South East Rivers Trust, or SET for short. Philly Nichols at Thames 21, and Mia Riddler at Action for the River Kennet, or ARC for short. Join us as they tell us all about the community engagement activities that the project offered. Well, hello everyone, and welcome to this segment of the episode. And we're going to find out what engagement and public outreach the Thames Catchment Community Eels Project did. And joining me today are three lovely guest speakers representing their organisation that was involved in the project. So tell me, ladies, how are we all doing? Yeah, good, thank you. (laughs) Good, thank you. Yeah, feeling good, excited. Good, good, I'm glad. Well, before we start talking about the engagement and outreach activities you worked on, I was just wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your organisation and what you work on individually there, and who would like to go first? So yeah, I'm Jess. Uh, I work for South East Rivers Trust, and I um, do a lot of the community engagement and volunteering activities on our rivers. Quite a lot of it's in South London, but we cover an area south of the Thames and 
east of Basingstoke, so quite a big, quite a big area to look after. <laughs> Great. And what do you do on this project specifically? So on this project, I've been mostly coordinating the citizen science aspects of it, and my colleagues. Uh, Charlene and Mel have been delivering guided walks and sessions with schools and uh, community groups. Love that, great. And Philly, what about you? Yeah, so I'm Philly. I work for Thames 21. So my role, I think the different organisations sort of did the project slightly differently. So Thames 21, I was the uh, sole eel officer basically like just uh, that's my job is to just focus on this eel project but I only joined in November so I missed a lot of the community engagement activities sadly so I was more looking at the data and mapping it and uh, communicating it to the local stakeholders and local community groups and things. That sounds great so you're you're fresh blood then. (laughs) Yeah yeah. (laughs) How about, how about you, Mia? Yeah, so hello, everyone. I'm Mia from Action for the River Kennet. I, I started working at Action for the River Kennet just before um, this eel project started. And like Philly, I've been kind of mostly on this eel project doing um, the community outreach, the citizen science and kind of all the elements of the project. And then in any other time that I've got in the other day a week, I do all sorts of work doing water quality testing and kind of helping out on anything that needs doing in the organisation. Um, and ARC look after the whole of the Kennet catchment. So it runs from Marlborough through Hungerford, Newbury, and then the Kennet meet the Thames in Reading and then in the past 18 months or so we've started looking after the River Pang which is in the South Chilterns catchment as well so it's been quite exciting because part of this project we've got to know a new river as well. Mm. Oh wow you're busy huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow that's great that sounds great what a lovely group to be talking to. So Jumping back into the eel project specifically and looking at the public outreach activities, what did you guys work on? And did you, did each organization, did they do the same public outreaches or did you kind of pick which ones you did or how did that work? Uh, shall I go? So as the project was a partnership project. We all did the same community outreach. So the community outreach was kind of split into, into a few sections. So there was the schools work we did. Um, so we worked, um, at the start of the project to develop the resources all together. So we were all delivering the same stuff and we ran workshops and assemblies for primary school aged children. And we all delivered the same thing. We all kind of reached different communities and catchments and numbers and things but we all delivered the same same content and we also all did eel riverbank walks and talks as well for various community groups as well that sounds great i'm wondering how did you promote the activities because they would have all been different yeah so i mean we did lots of lots of different things so we did like local posters and social media advertising and things like that and in local like what's on guides and things like that for the guided walks Um, and then we approached schools and community groups directly as well so yeah we did lots of ringing schools and going to schools and giving them information about what we had to offer to you know it's surprisingly difficult at this time to to get schools Mm -hmm. to um take up even free stuff I think they were quite focused on COVID um (laughs) in the last 12 months so um yeah but it's bit it was really nice once they could see what a good offering we had we did get quite a good uptake just a little while that's good yeah it must have been difficult because the project started in 2020 right when COVID got really bad did that that stun any of the project or did maybe did you use it to your benefit at all we adapted it slightly I think in the original plan for the project we wanted to do lots of in-person face-to-face workshops with the kids and and things like that we ended up doing some online lessons and assemblies to start with but then because it was full lockdown for the first few months of the, the project but then as summer came came into a bit more freedom and things like that we have done more face-to-face things in the in more in the autumn term so yeah just adapting I guess <laughs> yeah it was quite tricky doing it over zoom like with classrooms full of kids but I mean 
and they were quite used to it at that point. So it was it was easier than I thought it was going to be, but it was definitely very different from being in person talking to them. Mm. I think also um, Ollie, who was the previous EL officer at Thames 21, said that even when he got in the classroom, it was still very, you know, be as engaged with the kids as he wanted to be. And it was sort of standing here and talking to them. But I think you guys all seem to have done a good job and all the kids in our surveys and things absolutely loved it. So Did they? Did you get a good evaluation from them? Yeah, yeah I think from the Thames 21 kids, it was all like... Uh, yeah, and I was speaking to Ollie about it as well, and he said most of the most sessions he had in schools, the kids would me- like ask about electric eels, and Aww. they just loved all the fascinating facts. And even though he said no, they're not electric, you know, they were still like, <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I think as well. I think some of the kids like they love because because eels are a bit slimy and maybe some a bit gross, like slugs and things. They they quite like that. They because they're kind of funny looking, they're a bit mysterious. The kids just love that. And, you know, you can tell this tale of their amazing life cycle and this, this amazing journey they go on. So the kids loved hearing about them and, you know, how lucky they were to have eels in their local river. So, yeah, they, they really engaged well with, with the workshops. That's brilliant. That's what you want. That's really sweet. Was there anything that you would improve with the children activities for the future? So we started to do some... We managed to deliver a couple of outdoor sessions where we got the kids out to their local river as well. So we talked to them about how the eel life cycle and how they move up the river, but also did a bit of getting them in their wellies and getting them in the river to just have that kind of positive experience themselves. So hopefully, you know, if we get to do more eel related projects in the future, then we can do a bit more face to face and outside stuff as well. And that actually takes us on quite well to the riverbank walks. So one of the things you did there was take people on tours. Is that right? Yeah, we did lots of that. <laughs> what did what did that involve? Where did you go? Uh, so we uh, mostly, well, our work was on the River Mole. So that flows from kind of the Crawley area north towards uh, the Thames through places like Dorking and Leatherhead. So we worked in a couple of different areas, in mostly in reserves that were owned by wildlife trusts. And we kind of delivered the walk in partnership with them, which was really nice because obviously they they do a lot of the kind of terrestrial conservation on the site. Um, and we were more interested in the river side of things and the eels that live there. So it meant that, you know, classically rivers are not a brilliant circular walk because uh, <laughs> they're they're all very one directional um but yeah this way we could deliver a nice guided walk that I think yeah it gave people a really nice picture of the river but also how that fits in the in the landscape as well as we walk back towards where we started so yeah it was really nice and I think people were just astounded when people think of eels they don't really realize what a cool creature they are that's cool how how many people did you have involved in the walks was it quite a popular thing yeah it was really popular with arc it was um i think as well because people were because because we all based the whole project was about eels people don't know that eels live in their local river and often they didn't even know that these walks existed in their kind of local area so it was really good because people like discovering these local places um and kind of engaging with nature a bit more so it was really exciting for people and I think that's why they were so popular because well firstly because people don't know anything about eels um, and they found a lovely local spot to go for a little walk by the river. And yeah Ollie had a few sort of just groups of people who already knew each other so community groups that he'd reached out to and found and I think they really enjoyed it because Covid, as we were talking about before, so it's a way for these groups to get out together outdoors, see each other in the flesh, like, mm. and yeah, learn about the amazing eel. Yeah. Oh my God. That must have come at a really good time, actually. Did you do the walks throughout the, when did, because of COVID, did you do it more in 2021, perhaps? So the project started in 2021, um, in February time. Um, and then we ran our walks kind of in the spring, summer, and then we ran a couple in the autumn as well, but mostly in the summer of 2021. 
Okay, nice. And did you have any sort of way of evaluating if people, maybe if when the people first came to the walk and they didn't have much information about eels, did you have a way of evaluating if they learned anything by the end of the walk? Or was it kind of just word of mouth? So Ollie said that there was like a survey sheet. Is that, that's right, me and Justin. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, so we had a survey that had a few questions on to say whether you'd kind of heard of the organisation before and things like that. But some of the questions were all about, do you feel more connected to nature and things like that? And have you learned about the European eel? But just kind of yes or no questions. And then there was um, space for free text at the bottom where they could say what, what they enjoyed most and things like that. And we had really, really positive feedback from from those those surveys. Apparently, it was also just, you know, Ollie said he would just hit hit like either overhear people or they'd actually come up to him and say like I had such a good time as well so it's just those like anecdotal bits of evidence as, yeah as well yeah definitely that's lovely that's so nice that kind of makes me think you know you did there was some training to monitor eels going upstream in the river mole catchment did you do any training in the in the walks or the did they cross over at all no, I think they were quite separate because we started, we kicked, kind of kicked off with the monitoring back in like April. So it was before okay. we'd really kind of started delivering our guided walks at that point. So every, it was, I was amazed at how many people did take up the, the eel monitoring because it was, again, it's a completely new area for us. We've not worked in the River Mole much before, especially not doing community engagement stuff. So I was a bit like, oh, is this really you know, people, people maybe don't know who we are so much. And is this really the first activity that people are going to sign up to is like measuring eels, but people were very excited for it. And I think they had a really good time, but they, mm. yeah, there wasn't much crossover between the guided walks and that. It was kind of a, a standalone activity. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm specifically interested in this. I live right next to the river mole and I'm wondering from someone like myself, how do you monitor eels how where do you find them how do you see them tell me everything so we had so as part of this project as well we were monitoring or like surveying for barriers to eel migration but the way we measure um, and record eels is that on some of these barriers are eel passes that have a kind of trap built into them so the eels crawl up the path and plop into this trap and then every day or so the volunteers go check how many are there measure them which is it is hard as hard as it sounds <laughs> to measure an eel um, and then release them upstream of the barrier so we're then getting information about the size of the eels which kind of suggests how old they might be the number of eels that are coming into the, the river mole or wherever the trap is so it's really important information it all feeds into the wider uh, Thames eel management strategy because it gives an idea of how many young eels or, or elvers are being recruited into the catchment which as they're globally or you know they're very very critically endangered so it's important for us to know how our populations in the Thames are doing so it's it's really good and yeah the way you can get involved is we do training every year so there's yeah there's more coming up <laughs> this season Oh, sign me up. <laughs> you guys did, um, it was Molsey Lock, right, Jess? So it, we did it at a place called Island Barn Sluice, which is just on the River Mole. This year we're doing it uh, at Molsey Lock, yeah, so on the main turn. I actually did the Molsey Lock monitoring, yeah, in the summer 2021. It was oh. so good. I think you oh. trained me <laughs> in, uh, in April. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, you can come back again this year if you want. I'd love to. I just, because our job, you know, we're assessing barriers, so we don't often see eels, but doing the eel monitoring, you actually get to see them and you see how small they are and they've come all the way that, you know, from the Sargasso Sea. It's just incredible. I think I have to make make the journey. <laughs> come on, come on, get yeah. trained up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's really fun. And um, I think a, a couple of people were like, oh, well, I'm not sure about I'm not sure about eels. I know it's a very important work. That's why I've signed up to do it. But I'm not 
I'm not sure I'm going to like the eels because I think they were a bit maybe creeped out by how wiggly and slimy they were. But by the end of the summer, they were very keen. They thought they actually said to me that they thought they were cute now. So uh, I feel like that was quite a success (laughs) converting people because, yeah, I guess they're not the they're not as maybe visually appealing as a, a tiger or a panda or something. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this project's definitely helped convert a few people. <laughs> so, so, if, is it, so this will be something that you continue. Is this the only activity that you're continuing in the future? So it's the, the main activity that we're continuing on straight from this project. We're putting together a kind of another partnership bid to continue a lot of the aspects of this project and also expand it into new areas as well so keep your fingers crossed we might be able to carry on uh, some of the other aspects as well but yeah for now this right now that's the the thing that we're carrying on with Ah, and so so if somebody wanted if a listener wanted to join in in some of these in this activity how how did they go about doing that Drop me an email. <laughs> okay. It's also on the ZSL website, I think, as, as well, if you're not in the Molesy area, like, because there are a few traps, but I'm not sure which ones are active. Just get on the ZSL website and sign up. Yeah, because oh. they're, yeah, they're the main coordinators of all the, the, the Thames traps. So, yeah, they're good. Mm-hmm good people to get in touch with that's good okay cool so we've looked at a few activities there's a couple more on my list that we haven't spoken about in depth and correct me if i'm wrong the surveys were they part of the the riverbank walks were they separate no they were separate so the riverbank walks were for kind of community groups or the public to just get people out walking learning about eels enjoying enjoying the river and the environment and then the surveys were part of the obstacles part of the project so that was uh, walking the length of the rivers to um, find barriers to eel migration and did you have was this a citizen science thing did you have public coming in to help you count them yeah so it was a citizen science part of the project so we did a two-step training process where we trained the volunteers online um, with a PowerPoint and we told them all about the different barriers that we might see on the rivers. And then we met the volunteers in person and we did a bit of a walk by the river um, and we tested out the app, which we used to log all the barriers. And then throughout the summer and autumn, the different groups, you know, with with our support, um, went out and walked the whole of the, the, the river catchment. Ace, did you guys join in on that one? I did get to go out a bit. Yeah, it was nice. <laughs> Especially um, a lot of the mole is, uh, like the banks of the mole are privately owned. So it was about like liaising with the landowners to get permission to go there. But all of our volunteers were like, oh, I've not been here before. <laughs> and like it was yeah, like a little extra perk of the job to go and explore these bits of the rivers that not many other people get to go and have a look at. <laughs> That's definitely what our volunteers loved about it. They just got to see all these exciting places that they don't normally get to go to. Oh, that's lovely. All right. And last on the list, we have Eel Talks. So we spoke about things being moved online. Did you have a mixture of talks that were online and in person by the end? Yeah. Yeah. I think to start with, we were mostly online. And then I think by about August people were desperate to see people in person uh, and we ended up doing yeah, a few in-person talks as well towards the more in the autumn time so yeah it was nice it, I remember that I think as part of this project was my first face-to-face presentation like talk to a community group for about yeah over 18 months at that point and it was really nice <laughs> uh, yeah it's so nice seeing people in person after you've been on zoom for so long yeah oh yeah how did you promote the talks online? How did you get people to get engaged? So we approached existing kind of community groups that we thought might be interested and just dropped them an email and asked them, would they like a free talk all about eels and their local river? And yeah, a few people were very keen. So that was good. I think there was a bit of a slow start when people didn't know whether they would want to book an online talk or a in-person talk but I think everyone who did have one had a really nice well they definitely learned something new that's for sure 
did you have a way of evaluating that like you did on the surveys? No, that was just number of people that we managed to basically share the, the, the story of the eel with. We didn't hand out questionnaires or anything on those ones. Just just hope that people did absorb some of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, we did the same and approach community groups who um, we did talks for as well, but we, we did run a couple of public online talks as well, which I know both Tem21 and CERT did as well, and kind of promoted that quite a lot on social media and posters and things. And social media really helped us reach quite a large group and people kind of found out about the about ARC and what we do through social media because of all this promotion we were doing. So, yeah, it was really exciting to kind of reach new communities in the catchment. Mm, That's great. So now we've covered all of the outreach activities, haven't we? Yeah. What would you say was the most useful and beneficial activity in the project? I think that the obstacle serving has provided some really, really great data. So it's filled in loads of gaps for basically enabling us to prioritize our fish passage project on the mole and obviously the other catchments as well but for us we just had some you know some points on a map where we knew we thought there were barriers but now we know for sure exactly where they are what kind they are some rough dimensions for them we've got photos um, and also it's been a really great opportunity to build up the relationship with the landowners and things like that as well so to get the ball rolling and talking about the barriers that are on their lands. So I think, yeah, I know that I've got a very keen group of volunteers who are keen to c- continue doing more obstacle surveys because we managed to do 107 kilometres of the mole, but there's still... 191 left so wow. <laughs> plenty more to be going on with wow yeah and a lot of that only just becomes trickier and trickier like on the Ravensbourne and the Brent actually a lot of other upper tributaries haven't been done yet and that's where it can become you know it's overgrown loads of brambles so the speed at which you can get to uh, sections of the river survey decreases and you need your hardy volunteers in there so it'll be good to <laughs> yeah. continue yeah i agree with jess completely our volunteers doing our obstacle surveys are so keen to get going again they're um, desperate to get out and do more surveying yeah it was it's, it has been as jess said completely agree so valuable to us and because we've been working in the middle and lower Kennet which we don't do as much work in and the Pang which we've only just started looking after like I said earlier it's very exciting to to learn more about a new bit of river and meet people and communities that we haven't kind of interacted with before so getting people out by the river has been really valuable and just learning about the, the those bits of the river. I think also through that, like the riverbank walks as well were were really good because some people, you know, who were unsure about actually getting into the river and doing the surveys, but actually when you were doing the surveys, you didn't necessarily have to be in the river. But if you, you know, didn't know that much about eels or the river ecosystem, then the riverbank walks were a really good way to introduce community groups to their local river. And so that was, I think, really a good aspect of the project as well that we will hopefully continue. And I know in the Ravensbourne area, we're trying to then um, link it to nature prescribing, which is sort of becoming a more prevalent thing, which is really exciting that, you know, people who have gone to their GP to improve their mental health can then come and join us um, on riverbank walks and things like that. I think that's great. That's such a positive and beneficial thing for everyone to be involved with. It's it's so good to hear that everyone's had such a positive experience from it and it's fun as well. And I think maybe that's not what people would associate eels with. So it's really nice to hear that you might have like switched a lot of, lot of people's perspective on that. That's something to be really like proud of. And to wrap up, we've touched on this earlier, but what comes next now? Will you be, we've spoken a bit about this. Is there any other methods that you'll be carrying on in the future? I think it's a, a case of wanting to expand into new areas, but also continue making sure that we do manage to do those other 191 kilometers of the river mile with our obstacle serving. But yeah, I think there's lots of new things that we'd like to try as well. But yeah, hopefully funding dependent will we'll be able to to continue on with a lot of the aspects of this project. It's been really good to work 
together on like different rivers, but all in the Thames catchment and share ideas and, you know, troubleshoot things. It's been a yeah, really valuable experience, I think, for all of the trusts involved to work in that way. So hopefully more projects in the future. <laughs> Yeah, I think now we know a bit more what we're doing and we've done the training already. We will volunteers, it'll be easier to kind of roll out again, as we've all said, in the kind of more upper reaches of the river and finishing off what we didn't quite get done. So hopefully we'll be able to just kind of hit the ground running on our next project and continuing all the community outreach elements as well, because I think that has been really valuable. And also our data, like mapping skills have improved. And, you know, a lot of the struggles that we've faced, we can maybe the process can be much faster in the future. And, um, you know, now we know how to map the barriers pretty quickly and also like split up the river fragments online and figure out the connectivity and that sort of thing. We might be faster at that in the future. Everything sounds really good placement to be streamlined now. Yeah, because the... um, I mean, the obstacles surveys in general were a brand new thing for this project. We developed all the training together and got all the nice handbook materials and things like that all made as part of this project. So now it's we've got that nice kind of foundation to build on now. I think going to be going to be good. <laughs> That's great. Oh, well done. Yeah, I'm so proud. Well done for all your hard work and in behalf of all the public. Thank you. (laughs) And I think I'll wrap it up there. So thank you so much, you guys. Really appreciate that. I appreciate your time. Um, It's really interesting to learn all about that. So yeah, a big thank you from me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Up next in the third segment of today's episode, we explore obstacles. We learn what this is and where it's heading in the form of an app called River Obstacles. Join me as I speak with our next guest, Azra Glover, at the Zoological Society of London. Hello and welcome back to this part of the episode where we chat with Azra Glover about obstacles. Azra is a conservation project officer at the Zoological Society of London Welcome to the show, Azra. How are you doing? Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, doing good, thanks. Thank you so much for being here today. Before we get stuck in about obstacles, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at the Zoological Society of London? So like you said, yeah, I'm a project officer and I'm working on the estuaries and wetlands team. And working on the obstacles project was actually one of my first sort of proper in the field projects that I was doing and training people at ZSL previously have run quite a few different eel projects which you can find on our website there's lots of cool opportunities to get involved with and lots of research that we've been doing citizen science stuff but yeah so I've just been kind of working on this project with all the different partners um yeah excellent that's great what a rewarding job and it's, it's interesting to hear that there's loads of eel projects going on already so they're going to be revved up for this one to go. I was just going to touch on the citizen science part because for some of those that are listening that aren't sure what a citizen science or a scientist is, it's usually when you have volunteers from the public collect and analyse data relating to the natural world and typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. And a popular example of this is maybe going to your local park or perhaps the garden and taking photos of plants, insects or animals that you find. And then you just upload them onto a citizen science app. And from there, the app can identify what you've taken photos of, as well as a GPS tracker of where that photo was taken. And then from there, the scientists can use all that scrummy data in their own work. And it's all thanks to you. So it's a really rewarding practice. And absolutely, anyone with a smartphone can get involved, which is ideal. And that's a big part of what we're going to be talking about as well, isn't it? Yeah. I would love to know, the beginning of Obstacles, can you tell us what it is and how you were involved? So basically, it kind of came about through the pre-existing River Obstacles application um, and also the Zoological Society's Eel Barrier Assessment Tool that was made back in 2018, I think. And these are basically a way of sort of strategically identifying, assessing and sort of attaching a score to barriers to eel migration 
and I'm not sure if anyone's spoken about this before already, so I might be repeating myself. <laughs> no, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, so these barriers are barriers to migration are a huge factor that are influencing sort of the success of the European eel, especially in our rivers in the Thames catchment. So it's really kind of important to know where they are, how much of a problem they will be to the eels, and pretty much sort of linking all of these together so that we can get a catchment wide picture of where we're going to find some of these structures that could be limiting their migration and their movement, which can really affect their life cycle and their success in these different rivers. Mm. So basically, how it all started, we took the river obstacles application and the, the eel barrier assessment tool. And we wanted to quite kind of create a user manual so that, like you said, these citizen, these amazing citizen scientists can um, learn these methods, go out and repeat them in different areas. If it's their local area, or if they want to travel further and help us out <laughs> a bit more. Um, and it was basically working with our project partners, the different rivers trusts and um, Thames Estuary Partnership to create this standardized methodology um, for surveying. Mm, OK. And so you did you train some of the citizen scientists? to monitor these ill barriers? So basically it started off with a sort of train the trainer session. So that was set oh, ourselves okay. kind of role in this. So after we developed the user guide, Anna Forbes kindly arranged a lovely field day out um, at um, Avington Estate back in June. At the start of summer, it's one of my first times finally away from the laptop, which was lovely. Nice. And we trained the different project officers um, from the partners in this methodology it was actually a great opportunity and like a because it is a working progress after all this methodology and that's what's so good about working with citizen scientists and these different partnerships because you do get that feedback from them when they're using using the different materials so we trained up the trained up the trainers and we sort of came across a few problems and different issues and it was interesting actually all the different ways that people score things because it is based on sort of personal opinion a lot of the scoring and all the measurements are based on estimates rather than actually getting in the rivers and measuring things so that was the first step and then after that the trainers ran a kind of two-stage training process for the volunteers and it's aimed to kind of be as simple as possible as accessible as possible and the initial sort of part one was an online training over zoom and each of the different project partners ran a separate training session and ZSL sat in on some of those to give a bit of an eel background section and in that first training all the volunteers and scientists were taken through the whole user guide and given a background on all the different barriers a background on the project itself and the partners and yeah and then stage two was actually getting out there with the people that had been trained online and kind of doing a bit of a, a guided run through almost I guess and actually kind of working with the citizen scientists to kind of actually score some sort of test barriers that I guess we'd already kind of agreed scorings on and take them through a bit of a walkover, try and get different, it's all kind of group work as well. So trying to get people's scores to kind of match up and sort of talk through things like when we ask about, I don't know, it's quite difficult when you're sort of looking at the height of a barrier, say like a height of a weir in your head. Some people could say, I don't know, 50 centimetres and someone could say a metre, but when you kind of discuss it, you can kind of start kind of, I don't know, agreeing on things a bit better and it's all a bit more streamlined after the first couple of goes. But yeah, so it was that two-part training session. And then after that, volunteers were sort of ready to go off and start mapping and logging and yeah, getting some excellent data for us. Amazing. That's so cool. Okay. When they were doing the training sessions out in the field, did all the data go through the obstacle app? Yeah. So the river obstacle app is basically a way of capturing all that data that you get through the obstacles methodology based on the eBAP. So you basically you choose well in the first stage of the training as well, we took volunteers through all the different types of obstacles or structures that they'd be likely to see. So we've got the weirs, the sluices, boards, the culverts and stuff like that. So there's an option when you download the app and you log in and we taught all the volunteers how to sort of set up an account so that you can go back through and read your record after you've submitted them and you can edit these and all sorts of things. So you kind of go in, it's a GPS track, like you said. So you just, this is another thing, actually, the volunteers flagged. It's always good to make sure that your location accuracy is pretty <laughs> pretty spot on so that you're not logging a weir off in the town centre somewhere. Um, so you choose your structure and then based on that, the app actually is pretty handy, produces a lot of sort of follow through questions about sort of the height of the structure the width of the structure, if it's a slope, the kind of angle of the slope, 
takes you through all those sort of measurements that you can enter in there. And then there's another section that you can derive your eel barrier assessment tool score from. And this is basically a combination of all those different things about the structure, as well as kind of like the speed of the water at the time, the velocity, and it sort of comes out as a final score and you add that to the app. And then we also really encourage volunteers to take photos of the structure so that if we had any questions about it, we could just sort of go back in or if there's any confusion, go back in and the people sort of um, entering the data could have a look um, and try, kind of try and figure out what's going on because a picture can often be so helpful um, <laughs> and get to the bottom of things a lot easier. So you can enter your photos into there. And then there was another section to sort of add any comments or questions that they had or if they were unsure about the scoring or something that can all go in there and then it gets submitted and then it's then verified um, and then uploaded to the website and the roadmap so that we can see a big picture of all the, all the barriers that all the um, volunteers have been logging. So, yeah, a pretty cool final product and a bit of an ongoing piece of work that hopefully yeah, is going to lead to a lot of helpful tools for decision making and management stuff like that and I know it's already all the data is already being put into practice with different projects so yeah really exciting. Mm, That's great can you tell me a little bit more about the benefits of having all this data you just touched on it a little bit can you expand on that a bit more? Yeah so basically in terms of management and sort of especially fish management eel management it's really important to know sort of where these limiting factors are and a lot of the barriers that have been found actually weren't, well, most of the barriers weren't previously recorded on any of the databases that the project was looking at to sort of create that sort of before and after map of all the different structures. So now that we're getting these really comprehensive records of where these structures are, how limiting they could be, and sort of, and by knowing a bit more about them, we can also learn a bit more about how we could improve them if that was sort of the next step that was feasible. So. And then from that, you can kind of, I guess, create not a, well, in a sense, a priority list of where you want to focus your management or improvement efforts, how you'd like to do this, and then get a rough idea of how much this could cost, how long this could take, and how beneficial it could be to improving eel migration. Okay, I get that. That's really good. When we go back to the app and the training sessions, to be fair as well, how did you promote them? Did you have a lot of people that were interested? beforehand or how did you how did you gain people's attention the Thames catchment community ill project partners were all really amazing on social media and they had some really cool resources as well that were going out at the same time and I know that there are a lot of eel talks being run and river walks and educational programs so yeah it was mainly mainly all social media and I know that a lot of the project partners worked with kind of existing volunteer bases but also I think a lot was through sort of hyping the project up, really getting people involved. And it did have such a great uptake. And I think people do get really excited, especially when it's something that can make a difference in their local river. They can, like you said, citizen science can really get involved. And then there's that, because there's that data that you can see coming out of it and you can see where that data is going to be used and you can really sort of visualize it with this project in particular. It's kind of a nice feedback loop to have to really get people engaged um, mm. and have that sense of kind of like river stewardship like they've they found these barriers in the river um, this can really help to improve things for the eel and you never know one day when they're out on their next obstacle survey they might even be able to spot a couple so yeah that's great what about what about the future of the the river obstacle app can people can anybody use it what's the can people still use it after the eel catchment projects come to a close yeah so um it's the kind of thing as well, like I was saying, it is very much a working progress. And that was the kind of useful part. One of the most useful parts of sort of working in partnership was this feedback that we were getting. So the volunteers would go out there and we were getting even the project partners working with their volunteers. There was that constant feedback with them. They had sort mm. of groups on Facebook or on WhatsApp where they were communicating. And we were getting loads of different feedback, be it sort of kind of snagging issues within the app or kind of limitations with that the volunteers were finding within the methodology where things weren't quite running as smoothly because I guess all this was created in COVID times at home sitting at a desk and not actually kind of <laughs> out by the weirs and the sluices so it was really that kind of feedback coming back through and now working with Natural Aptitude who created the app they've been doing a lot of updates on there I know so hopefully the kind of next 
version of the app that comes out should be a lot more user friendly so that we can get sort of everyone using them and we can get people out in these different rivers that weren't part of the core project logging these barriers and I know I've been using it since in some of the projects that I've had leading on and one of the rivers that was part of this project the Ravensbourne River I went down and helped out with a couple of those and a lot of that data fed into another project about sort of prioritizing barriers um, that need to be improved and then later on in the River Crane, we've been using it to map some more barriers. So it definitely does have that scope out of the project and then um, the real potential to kind of get people out there and get people logging all these rivers all around the, all around the Thames. So, yeah, it should be hopefully something that will get picked up by a lot yeah, more people. Yeah, it's a great way of going outside as well. And you can engage with everything that's going on around you a little bit more. Yeah, and I mean, hopefully the training materials are kind of straightforward enough and clear enough that sort of like you said people with a smartphone can sort of pick it up and get working and even if you don't have a smartphone but one of your friends does you know it's a great thing to go out and do together as groups and it's nice it's always good to have that kind of debate based on these sort of of these (laughs) measurements and estimates and stuff it's always good to have a second opinion Um, (laughs) so yeah no I think it's a really great way to sort of get down there and get involved. That's brilliant, yeah. And now that the project's coming to a close and you review everything that's gone on, did you have any surprises that came out of this or perhaps was there any improvements for next time? Yeah, I guess quite a few different ones. I mean, I guess actually you do learn how important that kind of second in-person session was because I think at first we were thinking about it was kind of planned to maybe just have the online Zoom session then a follow-up session for people that might want more information but Mm. when it was decided actually after our train the trainer session how valuable it was to kind of get out of the classroom that we started in and actually go out there and try it out that you you do bring up all these questions that you didn't realize that you had at the beginning Mm. so that second in the field training session I think was um, a great choice and something that was a great lesson to learn and then after that just I guess all the we had a lot of sort of little bits of feedback so things about clarifying how important crawling media is for eels on structures so this is the kind of like algae across the surfaces or the rocky substrates and stuff that they can use to crawl up and sort of adapting how we're going to score that based on some of the volunteer feedback to make things a little bit more clear so that if you haven't had your training session for a while or you're not feeling so refreshed, you can kind of get straight on that app and get straight back into it and your mm. scoring's really, really certain. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I would like to use the app. I've downloaded the app. I think it's super user-friendly. So when you open it up, you see the map of the UK and then you see these little dots with numbers underneath them and that's how many tags there's been in that specific area yeah. and it's it's really fun to like zoom in to see your local area as well I'm wondering so what are the improvements for next time like I think it's already it's kind of got everything you need is there going to be is there going to be a game on it <laughs> <sighs> well, I mean there is an eel game online on the on the yeah there is <laughs> so if anyone's not checked that out yet um but I mean we could always link link the app to the game who knows yeah, why not <laughs> um but yeah you're right I mean it does I think Personally, it does work pretty well. And it is, a, yeah. like you said, a pretty straightforward way to do things. I guess we, we were having a couple of problems with people then logging barriers and the app would kind of time out and then you'd lose oh. a lot of data, which is why, in, which is another benefit of working in groups. We're getting a couple of people to log different things. But these are some of the improvements that are hopefully coming in the next version so that we don't have these kind of technical issues going on. But yeah, yeah, other than that, I think it's kind of just as long as we can get more people using it and people happy with using it and we've got the kind of capability to keep verifying that data. So then I think hopefully it will um it should all be pretty smooth. Yeah, fab. Go citizen science. Woo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't do it without them. No, we couldn't. And I I think that's really shining through this whole ill catchment project. It's a huge collaboration project and it's it's drawing in the public, it's drawing in partners. I think it's just it's such a great collaboration and it wouldn't really have been what it is without everyone's input and I think that's something to be really proud of. Exactly yeah and I mean all the partners have worked so closely together and we've all been in contact as it's going on people giving feedback or giving advice about extra things that you should sort of stress when you're running the when you're running the different training sessions or bits that volunteers have been confused about or not so sure about and how to kind of really 
perfect that in those training sessions. Couldn't have done it without the partners, couldn't have done it without the different citizen scientists. And I think all coming together has really made a difference. And it has been a really successful project, I think, and some really exciting data that's come from it that I think is now all available online for people to have a look at. And um, like you said, you can always get zooming into your local area and find some structures that you might not have known about before. Yeah, so rewarding. I love that. So Azra, before we wrap up, is there any other points you'd like to add? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Just basically a huge thank you to everyone that's been involved. And yeah, I hadn't hadn't worked much on eels eels or eel barriers before this, but it was a great sort of kickstart for my work at ZSL. And it was made super easy and very enjoyable by everyone that we were working with. So That's great. Very humbling. I love that. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. It's been a great, yeah, it's been a great learning experience and I'm looking forward to using the app in the future. (laughs) Yeah. Let me know if you have any, any feedback or any questions. I'd love to know how it goes. (laughs) I'll be waiting for that game. (laughs) Yeah. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> you could do, you know, um, you know, the snake game on the old Nokia. Maybe you can make it into an eel. Oh gosh, that would be good. Yeah, Wouldn't that be good. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Special credit to you at the end. There. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I hope you. I hope you enjoy using it. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome to the final segment of the episode, where we learn about how and where the data from this project is being used including learning about what a fish migration map is and why it's so useful. I'd also like to take this moment to share an update on behalf of Action for the River Kennet, as they are looking at eel river connectivity on a catchment scale. The data this project has collected has been especially useful to have a good dialogue with the environmental agency when prioritising barriers, asking the question if barriers should remain and if they're suitable for an eel passage instead. Within the project, ARC received funding to cover costs of two outline designs for eel passes, one on the Kennet and one on the Pang. Getting this far would not have happened without the project and without the up-to-date data, so a huge congratulations to all the partners involved. So once again, welcome to the final segment of today's episode on where we discuss how and where the data of the Thames Catchment Community Eel Project is heading, and joining us are guests Wanda Bodner from Thames Estuary Partnership, And joining us again is Philly Nichols from Thames 21. Hello and welcome to this section of the episode. I am joined by the lovely Wanda Bodner from Thames Estuary Partnership and also by the lovely Philly Nichols from Thames 21. Thank you so much for being here today. How are you both doing? All good, all good, thank you. Yeah, fine, thank you very much. (laughs) Good, great. Well, Earlier on in the episode, we learned who you were, Philly, but we haven't found out about Wanda. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do at Thames Estuary Partnership and what you did in the Thames Catchment Community Ill Project? Sure. So I've been working with Thames Estuary Partnership since 2018. I was volunteering before and I was a project officer on the Fish Migration Roadmap until the end of March this year, actually. And basically during that time, my main role was on focusing on bringing together fish migratory barrier data. So all the location of the locks, the weirs, the sluice, etc. And then trying to map them within the Thames River Basin or at least part of the Thames River Basin. And then making it a sort of a clever interactive map where you can pinpoint priority areas. So if you want to open up a river section, which has a big lock in the middle, then where where would you start if you would want to mitigate or if you want to open up that stretch of the river? Cool. That's exciting. Can you tell me what sort of data you collected from the project? And then we can learn about the ways that you're going to be using this data for future work? Sure. So basically, the problem is that there is no centralized data set when it comes to these barriers. Or there is, but then also other people are also collecting. So during my sort of research and during the project, I basically came across with the fact that there's like four 
different main data sources, which are some some of the locations are overlapping, but some are not. Uh, there are worse additional sources from stakeholders, from their reports, from their walkover surveys. I could sort of bring in other barrier locations as well. But in in all of this crowdedness of the data, what also came out that these data sets are not updated. And so basically the next step, what was really needed is to to be able to see what's really there. So there's one thing to have a data on an Excel sheet or in a report or in a shapefile. And there's another when it comes to whether if it's physically there. And my project didn't really allow the fact to be able to survey the River Thames area. And so at the end of 2020, this whole opportunity came across with the with the Thames Rivers Trust to be able to actually be part of the development of a, a citizen science project. At the time, we were already redeveloping in partnership with other stakeholders, redeveloping the uh, River Obstacle app. And so as part of the Thames Catchment Community Eels project, we were able to actually put this app in to use and we were able to get volunteers involved and then have them go out and they started to do their surveys. And that actually was bringing in on-site data, which then become extremely useful. The only thing is that obviously they were concentrating on a much smaller area than my whole study area was. But in any case, by surveying those five major rivers, we were able to overlay all the data sets and then realize that actually those four main data sets that I originally had, they are out of date. And actually the citizen scientists have found approximately 50% more barriers than the data actually shows. So this was extremely helpful. The roadmap methodology, uh, I was able to sort of bring it to the next level and and sort of develop it and integrate the usage of the app. And then with the other lovely stakeholders as part of the project, for example, with Thames 21, and there was an opportunity to start to look forward and to actually start to put some form of ideas of mitigation measures in place. Perhaps that's what Philly can talk about more in terms of what are the next steps because I was really the sitting behind the desk and looking at the data but it's them stakeholders who really do this field work who can actually utilize the data. As Wanda said she was sitting behind the desk but she was sitting behind the desk being extremely helpful because we couldn't have done it without her um, like her guidance throughout, you know, we, we did a few workshops where she explained how to actually make use of the data. So once we had the data, so it was like point data. So you've got where the barriers are. And within that, you could see, you know, the barrier name, grid reference and other things like the EBAT scores. So when we were assessing then the next steps, which barriers to prioritize. Yeah, we also Southeast Rivers Trust, Thames 21 and Action for the River Kennet all adopted this methodology of looking at whether the barriers were had EBAT scores of less than 10. So that's the moderate possibility, but also low possibility, and whether they had eel tiles on them yet. So if they didn't have eel tiles on them and they had a score of less than 10, we would look at that as a priority barrier. But obviously there were other things like river connectivity, which Wanda can talk about as well. Take it away. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it, as part of the roadmap, it's not just the data and the location of the barrier. It's also what is beyond upstream. So if there is suitable habitat or actually the length of the river section, how far is the next barrier upstream? If there is some form of development perhaps happening or if there's a pollution event because fish want to move away from pollution, for example, but if they can't because of the barrier, then that's an issue as well. So a lot of these things were considered 
or can be considered when you're looking at the map and you're trying to figure out what to do with your river patch. And then obviously more data layers can always can be brought in, but uh, we were a bit limited. Obviously, the, the River Thames itself, that's a little bit more occupied, especially in the river side of it, and there's a lot happening around it. The, the tributaries are less so. I think there's more work that can be done around there. Mm. So when we talk about the fish migration roadmap, can you explain to us exactly, well, can you clarify what the roadmap is? and how it's linked to the eel catchment community, eels project. The idea of the roadmap is really coming from from the Netherlands. It was developed by Peter Philipson. It's his idea. And then we started to work together to try to implement it here. And basically the roadmap is both the interactive map and also the methodology. So what you need to imagine is that if you have a series of roads and you're driving around them then you need to know where you can turn left where you can turn right where there might be blockages etc fish will use rivers in the very same way and so if they want to let's say if you're a european eel since that's the centerpiece of this project if you're a european eel and you're coming up from from the Sargasso Sea and from the Atlantic Ocean, then you will start to make your move into the freshwater rivers of Europe. And one of them being also part of it, the Thames. And so they can swim through the Thames estuary, which is partly salty, partly brackish, and then it becomes freshwater further upstream. And there's about 13 tributaries that are flowing into the Thames estuary. And so if you're an eel, then you want to be able to turn right or left from the Thames estuary and then move up to freshwater rivers where you can spend the other half of your life and find suitable habitats, um, eat, etc. And so the problem is that some of these rivers, so if you're coming up from The Thames estuary, for example, you can't really, if you're an eel, you can't really turn, for example, into the Ingeborn because there's a tidal flap there. So you can't swim up or or over there or on the river roading. You can because I believe there is a pass. uh, There's a barrier just at the, uh, at Barking Creek. But if you are swimming, if you want to swim into the River Ravensbourne, then at Deptford, there's going to be a, a set of weirs, I believe. Yes, there are some tidal weirs there, but they look from the outside and when the tide is low, they look pretty impassable to eels, but they actually do get overtopped at high tides. Yes, yeah, so there, there's that. So that's also another factor that you need to consider. For example, if, if a weir or a barrier seems impassable, then there's other elements, physical elements that can take effect. And so if you're coming with the high tides, then it's lucky for you. But <laughs> obviously, if you're not, then you have to hang around. And so there's many of these barriers even further upstream on these tributaries, not just where they meet the Thames. And so the idea is that all these are met. And then you can use the data and then you can help these fish to get from A to B, especially when they want want to get further upstream. So that's the roadmap as a concept, really. And then the the roadmap map is the interactive map, which you can find at fishroadmap.london. And there you, you will be able to see all the rivers or the location of the barriers you're going to be able to overlay other la- uh, data layers and then you can filter the data in a way that maybe you can prioritize these barriers mm. and make decisions accordingly. With all the data that you've collected, what are the what are the next point of cause, especially in terms of this fish migration map? Yes, so I believe we came into the picture with the roadmap through one of the workshops that I held uh, just at the beginning of the pandemic in April 2020. And then Anna Forbes from Thames River Trust really liked the idea. And then we became partners on this project. And then basically the roadmap became a method of visualizing 
the results of the Times Eels project and what people were doing and uh, where they needed to survey and where they surveyed eventually. It's so great that you used that word visualising as well, because when you have all this data, that you the thing that you really want to make an impact is the, the presentation to it, and especially when it comes to audiences, your larger audience. And I know like at the end of a report, I really look forward to just like visualizing everything. Like I've got like pie charts, I've got infographics, and it just makes me feel like really good to like see it all in place. I'm just wondering, is there, besides the fish migration roadmap, is there any other methods of visualizing your data that you've done? No, I did create a small GIF, which Ooh. looks like the uh, <laughs> London Underground Network with all the rivers. And then I you can that. see how the fish trying to get to A to B. I haven't, but I think the interactive map itself is already should be quite useful for the right people. And I agree with you. Actually, I find that in generally in science, just visualizing and just be able to communicate your data is extremely important. And I was I was very fortunate, I think, because having a map which everyone likes to look at made it very easy to actually communicate uh, the project <laughs> as well to other stakeholders and to be able to sort of show them and and explain them how it works. And so, yes, I I definitely agree. Visualizing your data is a must when it comes to communicating your science. Absolutely, yeah. It's paired of that, aren't science all over again? I was reading one of your papers, Wanda, with Amy Pryor and Peter Philipson about the fish migration map. And I noticed fish migration vision. And Philly, before we chatted, one of the things you sent me was one of these vision things. I was wondering if you could explain to me what this vision is and how does this work in terms of the eel catchment project? Yes. So we use Story Maps, which is yeah, an app that through like online art GIS. And it's just a fantastic way to sort of layer by layer, you can add your data to maps and people, the volunteers can go on there, see what we did with their data so that they can actually, as you were saying before, visualize. visualize. <laughs> yes. yeah. it's, perfect. it's perfect. So yeah, we created that and we've called it Thames 21's Fish Migration Vision, Action for the River Kennet also have done one as well as um, Southeast Rivers Trust. So the eel force of each project partner can go on and see yeah, what's and visualize the data. So ours, then that connects to the fish migration roadmap because the vision, I guess, is the roadmap. We've used the roadmaps methodology to create this where you can see, you know, what's connected, what's the, what it's really easy then for just anyone to go on and think, oh, well, that's a priority barrier. You know, that's blocking loads of habitat upstream because you can see this big red line of where there's eels can't get to. And we've called it fish migration vision because a lot of the barriers, if if we can, so the, the first thing you want to do if there's a priority barrier is just remove it. But um, because that would benefit so many species and connect the, you know, river up. Yeah. But um, unfortunately, especially Brenton Ravensbourne catchments that I was working on, are quite urban. So we can't always remove them because they're in concrete channels and there's big flood risk and things like that. So then you put eel passes and things on. But if you're, if you are able to remove the weir, that is, you know, obviously not just benefiting eels, it's um, benefiting loads of other fish species as well as invertebrate species, you know, plants and all that. So that's why it's the fish migration vision because eels were sort of the flagship for it, but it's benefiting so many other species as well. Mm. If anyone is wondering why do we have so many locks and weirs, etc., it, it, it is all something that we inherited through the land use and uh, water management purposes really so that was the reason why all these artificial barriers were created a lot of them are sort of redundant so they don't really have use anymore but a lot of them will come with some form of heritage so they can't be removed some will have function still those can be removed but there are some which will which can which could be addressed is then the next step is 
who owns it, who owns the land, where the barrier is, etc. So there's a bit of a red tape involved there when mm. it comes to addressing these structures. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I can appreciate that. Well, I can definitely say that the River Thames as a whole, it's that's quite okay. So fish can get from A to B. That's great. But when it comes to the tributaries, then then this it gets becomes more of an issue. Mm. Also, mm. I think, I mean, you said earlier, where could people go and actually see the barrier data? And there's all of the barrier data that, we collected and then Wanda um, verified is on, I think it's on the Thames Estuary Partnership website. If you Google Thames Catchment Community Eels Project, there'll be a link and you can you can go on and click on the dots and, and you can see all the data and yeah, loads of information about each barrier. Yeah, we especially want to see that gif that you've made, Wanda. It's it's so cool. <laughs> it's a great it's it's a great gif. It is a great gif. I love it. I think what a great way to end today's episode. Thank you so much to my guests. I've got a lovely Philly and Wanda. And thank you so much for your time today, guys. And I'd like I'd just like to thank everyone that's been involved for all their hard work. It's been really exciting to learn about everything and I'm just, I'm really impressed and I'm speaking on terms of all the ills. Thank you for all your hard work. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Our pleasure. Thank you so much, Chloe. You have now reached the end of today's episode. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed learning all about the Thames Catchment Community Ill Project. If you missed any of the useful links said in today's show, you can find them in the episode show notes. I'd like to take this moment to thank everyone that has been involved in this episode. It's been great to listen to all of these talented, fabulous experts in the field, and I wish them all the luck in their future projects. This episode has been brought to you by me, Chloe Russell, on behalf of the Thames Estuary Partnership, and I look forward to welcoming you next time.